So welcome, West Coast people. Good so, afternoon. Good afternoon. So welcome to the, the West Big Coast. Big Sur and Carmel Valley. You have some stuff from my area. I like that. I, I got to try that gin. You, have you tried it? No, I haven't. Okay. So it's Grey Whale out of Sebastopol, but it's, um, it's really good. So we're about to use this one to mix tonight. And at the end of the session, we're giving away a bottle of gin. And also a stay at one of the iconic luxury hotels. So stay on to the end and we'll pick a winner. So, so just to kind of that explain why we're kind of doing gin and iconics. So this came out of when I was talking to Lisa, who's the salesperson for iconic luxury hotels. We were just talking about doing some fun events and we were like, well, instead of gin and tonics, let's do gin and iconics. So that's kind of how it came about. And I'm, I'm a gin drinker, I love gin, and I know a lot of people are getting more into it in the US. Um, in UK, you can, like you can get flavored vodka over here. In, in UK, you've got like virtually every flavored gin you can think of now. Rhubarb and ginger and raspberry, and they're doing every flavor gin. So there's a much better selection of gin now in the US. But I think we'll be getting more of that as it comes kind of across the pond. So today we're looking at really just some of the traditional iconic gin drinks that are different from just doing a gin and tonic. So I met Marsha a while ago. Marsha May is a natural mixologist. And I love the fact that she also looks at, okay, you're drinking alcohol, but you can also put some good things in there. So it's also good for you. Um, and she has a, a wealth of knowledge on, that she's been imparting to us on you know, the gins and the drinks and the mixing and how and why, what to do and what not to do. So um, I'm gonna hand over to Marsha. We're gonna do three cocktails. We'll stop in between, but this is interactive. Ask questions. If you wanna, you know, if you wanna ask questions or whatever, it's fun as well. So we're gonna make and drink and, and have a bit of fun. So I'm just gonna spotlight Marsha so we can all see her a little easier. So Marsha, over to you. Um, yes, yeah, so my company is The Natural Mixologist, and like Cheryl's saying, the, the focus is really on um, being conscientious about what we drink. Yes, if you choose to have a cocktail, have one that is as healthy as possible. Um, so I'm going to try to like impart those little things that we can do to make our drinks better for us, um, but also please, please ask as many questions. Even if it sounds like a crazy question, go for it, because... Um, one of the best compliments that I had recently was after a tasting session, a woman said to me, she's like, these are all the questions that we've had our whole life, but because we've been drinking since we were in our 20s, like you don't feel like you can ask anymore because you should know it. Not at all. Please. please I asked, uh, on the session earlier on, I asked what's the benefit of having round ice cubes. So you can ask anything. <laughs> Um, so the very first thing that I want to do is um, uh, the first cocktail that I'm going to show you how to make is a gimlet. But what, before I do that, I want to show you how to prepare a rimmed glass because a lot of people, um, this is like a super, super easy trick for yourself when you're entertaining at home. It's a really good way to just elevate your cocktail and make it seem like it's something that's really, really fancy, but literally takes no work. So what you do is you have a, either a cut lemon or lime, and we're only gonna put it on the outside of the glass, and you're rubbing it around a third of the glass, and you're actually going a little bit down the glass. We're never doing on top, we're never doing inside, it's just a little on the outside of the glass like so. Then I have a plate of some type of flavor. Um, you could use tahini. Um, you, I use like a uh, spice rub for that you would typically put on, um, your, you know, your meats. Um, and then I also have like a citrus melange, which is made out of citrus peel that, so whenever I do juice lemons or limes, I go ahead and zest them first and then dehydrate that zest and put it in the, um, in my Vitamix and then put it with either sugar or salt, whatever your preference is. So you've got your pretties on the plate and then you just press into it like so. And it's really, really, really simple, but like now you have what looks like a super fancy glass and you never wanna go all the way around. You only wanna do a third to a half of the rim 
And the reason is because our taste buds become habituated after 11 bites of anything, food, drinks, whatever it is. So the fact that you have some with and some without, it'll keep your cocktail interesting. So the first cocktail that we're gonna make with our gray whale gin is Gimlet. So Gimlet is a super classic um, English cocktail that was actually created in about the 1800s, kind of accidentally by a British Royal Navy physician who found a way to preserve lime juice um, and create a cordial, which uh, lots of us have heard of like Rose's cordial, Rose's lime cordial. Um, he, he is the person who actually created this in order to allow limes to be kept on ships so that the, so the, the sailors would be able to have a daily ration of lime juice, which is the number one thing that prevented scurvy um, from continuing to decimate um, sailors. So the, I was reading a book on scurvy and it says that there have been more people who have died from scurvy than have died from any war ever. So it was a huge thing, like a, a boat would take off with like 1500 sailors and come back with three, uh, sorry, 300. So it's like, it was just really, really devastating. So they needed to find a way to preserve this. And basically this doctor came up with Gimlet. So what we're gonna do is take um, a measuring instrument and I'm using two parts or two ounces of our gin. And the reason why you say part instead of ounce is because maybe we're dealing in milliliters and not um, and not ounces. So it's totally fine, but you want to keep the proportions the same. So it's two parts of gin. And then I'm putting in three fourths of an ounce of lime juice. And you want to measure every single ingredient. So you can't say half a lime you can't say half a lemon, you actually need to measure the juice that's going in. So, and then by the way, this is the way that limes go into this. Some people do it the other way around. That's not correct. Can't want to. <laughs> it's this way. Oh, it's pointed side up, that way. That way. Oh, okay, I, well, I was doing mine upside down then. Because <laughs> this, this allows the juice to come out of the bottom. It just makes less mess. Uh, right, let's make less mess. <clears throat> so three fourths of an ounce of our lime juice and then our simple syrup. So the simple syrup, um, if you saw the email that went out early, simple syrup is exactly that. It is super simple. It is equal parts uh, sugar and water. And I make mine in the container that I'm gonna store it in. So for example, for this size container, you just fill it about halfway. You don't have to be super precise pour boiling water over the top of it. As soon as it's cool enough to touch, that's fine. Give it a swirl, don't burn yourself, like that's it. And then I'll keep in the fridge for three months. Um, so it's two parts gin, um, three fourths part lime juice. And then I don't like my gimlets to be so sweet. So I'm only gonna use a half an ounce of my simple syrup. Bring that in. And then once everything is built in whatever your shaking device is, then you add your ice. You don't add your ice until the very end because if you get distracted, you wouldn't want your drink to get all watered down. And then we're gonna go ahead and shake that up. I'm gonna hold it up on this side. into my pretty prepared glass. And you have a fabulous coffee. Uh, and the benefit of using this type of yes. juice over the kind that you squeeze onto is that you get essential oils with this. I didn't 
I learned that today. So yeah. cheers to those that are making it. It's very pretty. That's good. I have a question. Yeah. I, I, I'm not a gin drinker. I've never have. I never been. And maybe I've had gin in some previous drinks long, long time ago. But I'm a vodka drinker, a wine drinker, a champagne drinker, and a sake soju drinker. So I don't know. Between vodka and gin, I don't. I always find gin to be a little bit. I, now that gin has evolved. Cheryl and I know there's been so many much more than your typical old-fashioned gins around I don't know maybe I should give it a try again but I always I don't know that's just I would I would super super recommend it because here's the thing if we think about where gin came from historically it was very very heavily botanical and very juniper forward which juniper is a very intense flavor compound um so those types of older gins, what you would consider like the beef eater style or the traditional Bombay, not the Bombay Sapphire, but the old Bombay, those were so intense. And that is called a London dry gin. So if you don't like that super intense juniper, the style of gin that you wanna go for is called the modern or the new world style of gin. And that's what gray whale is. Um, it's also what Hendrix is. Uh, it's also what, let's see, um, the botanist. The botanist is like very, very botanical. So it has a lot more of like chamomile and rose. And it's not having those really, really intense juniper notes. It's a much lighter spirit. So I would definitely, definitely welcome you to try it again. And the way that I would suggest that you try it, because you said that you like champagne, is have a French 75. One of my favorites. Yeah, I'd like, it, I, I love, love, love a French 75. So it was actually created, um, it was, it's fabled that it's named after the end of the Second World War by a general who was in a, in a bar in France who, as they were celebrating, he said, champagne is not enough, I need more. So he requested, he created the cocktail sort of right then and there and said, I want to have he actually asked for a cognac, which is the old way that a French 75 was made, um, but not, tr not anymore. If you order a French 75 in a bar today, what it is is an ounce of gin, um, a half an ounce of lime juice, and then a half an ounce of simple syrup, and then it's topped with a brute sparkling. Super good. You will never drink a mimosa again. Like there's <laughs> like just... Hi there. mimosas. I mean, I, I love the, just the simple taste of champagne and, you know, the simple, I, you know, I, if I drink vodka, sometimes I just drink it on the rock. So that's me. And for gin, I, yes, that was correct. A beef feeder or all those, uh, those were like, you could smell them a mile away and you knew somebody who was drinking it, you would be like. Try a French 75. And the other thing I would say is um, like traditionally a gin and tonic, the tonics have been really bad. I find that the tonics have come such a long way now that if you get, like, if you had, say, a beef feeder gin and a sweats tonic, and you have a Hendrix gin and a fever tree tonic, totally different drinks, totally different drinks. One of them is just much harsher, and I, I don't particularly like that. And, you know, if you go into a bar and they've got a gum tonic, mm. um, so yeah, a, a, there's a big difference now. Deb, much. I have to say, as a former vodka and wine only drinker and an anti-gin drinker, I can tell you a horror story that nobody wants to hear about from my college days involving gin. <laughs> Not the good gin, the bad gin. I'm completely changed now. I, I really enjoy a lovely gin cocktail. I, mm -hmm. it, it's revitalized, I think, um, where I find, I, I love vodka, don't get me wrong, but I find it a little boring now where um, gin, and I, it's, it's just more interesting yeah you, you've she got because i bought it to me i don't even drink it hardly anymore because it's gotten boring it's gotten overkill so but i know gin has evolved so much but it, i'm just because of my experience with it and it, just the smell of it previously has always turned me off that's why i you think takeaway take 10 is also a good new one that i like marcia you were mentioning some of the new ones 
I think Tanqueray Tin is awesome. A little milder too. Kind of like a Bombay, I think. I li I'm a Hendrix drinker normally, or um, the one I like is Hendrix Solstice, which is one of the select ones, which is a really, it's a little more florally, um, mm. but it's a little different. But I, I like Greyware, I actually drink this at home. But they, I mean, I think the thing, nice thing with this is none of these drinks have tonic in them. And if you, you know, if you're not, if you don't like the gin and tonic, then a French 75 or a Gimlet or the Tom Collins that we're going to make, because sometimes people don't like the tonic flavor. But there's so many other drinks you can do that don't involve the tonic, so. What do you garnish your, your Hendrix with, Cheryl? I'm a cucumber person. I love it. Excellent, that's great. Hendrix gin, fever tree tonic, and a long slice of cucumber. Mm -hmm. That's, that's Excellent. me. That's me. He has recently come out with a new um, mixer, which is called their Light and Refreshing, which is, it doesn't have any artificial anything. It just has less sugar. So it gives you like the botanical notes of a traditional, um, really, really high quality tonic, but just less sugar. So I really like, I'm enjoying that one a lot right now. Um, they also have an elderflower. So if you do like the more like floral side, you can do an elderflower tonic water. There's, I would, I would, I hundred percent back up what Cheryl said is that you don't go with Schweppes um, or anything that, Q Tonic is the is a good brand or um, Fever Tree. Those are the yeah. only ones that I would. Or Fetterman's. I quite like Fetterman's as well. This is another good British one. Um, yeah. And what I find uh, there's another one, the Aromatic Tonic, that um, that it, which is a pink one. So it kind of makes a fun gin and tonic because you you get a little bit of a pink color to it, which is nice. But yeah, the, the Fever Tree range of tonics is really good. There's a couple over here in the US that we can't get, and that's the citrus, the mayo, the lemon one. And I haven't seen the blood orange one either. I think I saw it once and that was it. So they have a whole range of flavored tonics, but the elderflower is really nice. So back to you, that's about my gin drinking. <laughs> I love it, I love it. Um, and then this is, so, on the very, you know, um, super eco-friendly um, range, this particular brand, I don't know if you can get it wherever you guys are located, but the brand is called Green Bar and it's distilled in downtown LA. It's a husband and wife company. And it's all organic uh, and they have the full range. So their, their vodka is actually distilled from pomegranates. So it's not flavored vodka. It's distilled from pomegranates. So you have this like beautiful like floral note to it. Um, this, this particular gin is like meant to represent the flavors of LA. Um, they donate, a, they, they plant a tree for every bottle you buy. Like it's just a really great brand that I highly recommend. And mm -hmm. you can't find the gray whale or, or want something else that's much, much softer. It's a cool facility. I know I, I did a tour there and like their lemon flavor, literally they're just like zesting lemons and like opening up vanilla pods. There's nothing synthetic about their flavors. It's all natural, which is really cool. Yeah, no, I, 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 um, I think that they're just doing brilliant things, really unique flavor profiles, really unique stuff. But yeah, they're vanilla. Like this is, they, they, take Madagascar vanilla beans and like split them open by hand and drop them into the, dis into the still. So it's, I uh, have the ginger as well, because I like using a little bit of that ginger in a Moscow mule, which is very cool. Is, oh, yeah. yeah, they're good. Anyway, so on to cocktail <laughs> soup. Yes, okay, so um, the Tom Collins um, was, it, it, the first time that it was ever seen in print was in Jerry Thomas's 19, sorry, 1876 book called The Bartender's Guide. It's like one of the foundational books on cocktail making. So if you only have a couple of books, like this is one of them that you should have because it's just so classic and iconic. And the way that this particular cocktail is made it's made in a, um, this is called a highball, and it's made in the glass. So that, 
process of making your drink in the glass is called being built in the glass. So you don't need a fancy mixing tin. It's just super easy to make whenever you want a fast and easy cocktail for yourself at home. So the way that we're going to do that is um, I'm going to put what ice I have left um, into my glass. In an ideal world, you would have a slice. A bit more. And we're going to pour our gin. Again, we're going to use two ounces of gin, and we're just going to pour that straight into the glass. So one ounce. And two ounces. Some lemon. Our fancy squisher with the lemon like in this order. And it's three fourths of an ounce of lemon juice. And it's pretty, you want to get like if you've got almost enough, but not quite, the, the trick to get just a little bit more out is after you've squished it like this, you just turn it on its side and you'll be able to get a little bit more out. That only works if you just need a teeny bit more. Like me. And again, the thing about pressing with this is that you are expressing all of those essential oils from the skin. And the, the skin has a much, much higher concentration of vitamin C than the juice itself does. So you want to get as much of that skin in there as possible. Um, so if you ever have the option of like having a twist uh, in a cocktail, always do that because you're going to get more of those essential oils, which is the part that's going to counterbalance the inflammation that the alcohol causes. So vitamin C um, decreases inflammation, which is caused by, this, by the spirits. And then we're using our simple syrup again, and I'm only going to put in a third of an ounce because I don't want mine too sweet. It's like most things, you can always add more, but you can't take it away. So it's kind of like salt. You can always put more salt in, but you can't take it back. So start with the least amount. And then once you understand what your palate preference is, then you got it and you're good. And then you just top it up with seltzer water. Uh, a sparkling water, seltzer water, club soda, whatever your preference is. And that gives you a really tall, lovely, poolside afternoon cocktail drinking so that it's slightly longer than a martini beverage. So cheers on that one. And this is the one that like we all know from um, cheers. Robert De Niro's um, performance in Meet the Drink. This is what they're like, all right, let's have a Tom Collins. So there's our Tom Collins. It's very refreshing. Very good. Like, Marsha, like question, Marsha. <laughs> you didn't put a garnish on that. Do you normally do it, uh, put something on it? So that's a good question. Um, uh, you know, a lot of times if you're just bartending at home and you just want a cocktail, no. Um, if you wanted to have something pretty, uh, I'm always in favor of that. If you were to put a lime wheel, that would be pretty. Um, and that just go, gets dropped straight in. Uh, if you put a lime wedge on the side of a cocktail, the reason why you do that is that the guest is then able to moderate whether or not they add additional lime. So that's the difference between having a, a lime wedge and a lime wheel a lime wedge allows you to add more citrus yourself, whereas a wheel is just for pretty. So any other questions? Another nice non-gin non and tonic drink. I have a question. I, like, I never measure anything. I just kind of always pour by what I think is going to be the right proportions. I've 
been told that I tend to make my drinks a little bit on the strong side, but they don't taste strong to me. <laughs> so how important is it to measure when you're making a cocktail? So it really is based on, I, I would, what I would say is um, understand the rule and why the rule exists and then do what you want. Um, but understand the proportions to begin with. It's kind of like baking or cooking. Like, you know, when you make cookies, you need to like measure the flour, but if you're making an omelet, like there's no measuring, you just chop. So understand why and then do what you want. If you're happy with the way that your cocktails are coming out, then by all means, just keep doing what you're doing. But the, the ratios have been calculated, they have been calibrated. And if I go in, a bar and I see people free pouring that's not that's professional like that's not um that's not taking the craft seriously which it's way way different if you're just pouring yourself a drink for happy hour than if I'm paying $16 for a cocktail so it really does depend on what your level of happiness is with the result um a really, really good measure of thumb and just rule across the board is two parts strong, one part sour, three-fourths part sweet. That's like the, the standard. And then you deviate from there. And that, um, that sour is always either lemon or lime. There is no other thing that is sour enough to be sour. Um, the strong is just whatever your spirit of choice is. And then the sweet, uh, if you're talking about the really classic way to do it, the sweet is just a simple syrup, but the New Orleans or the modern style is where you would actually use a sweet liqueur. So something like a creme violette, a liqueur, a creme de pêche, like all of these are mostly French liqueurs. And the difference, the difference between a liquor and a liqueur is that a liquor is typically around 30%, whereas a liqueur is around 20. So it has a much, much higher sugar content. So it's going to bring in that sweetness. The other type of liqueurs are um, orange liqueurs. Those are way more popular than like the two that I just showed you, right? So an orange liqueur, we've all heard of triple sec category. It's not a brand. Triple sec is the equivalent of saying SUV. Um, and when you think about the words triple sec, sec going back to, you you know, like you're familiar with the champagne. So sec in French means sweet. So anytime you see like a demi sec or sec on a bottle of sparkling wine, you know that it's going to be sweet. Triple sec is a orange liqueur from France that is very sweet. When the recipe calls for triple sec, it doesn't mean that bottle of Hiram Walker that's like $8.99. It means Grand Marnier. So Grand Marnier is the most popular brand of triple sec, which is the category. The other category of orange liqueurs is Curacao. So Curacao was created by the Dutch on the island of Curacao. And the difference between triple sec and curacao is that triple sec is way sweeter and has a lot more of viscosity. It's a thicker feel, whereas curacao is much more orange for it. The most popular brand of curacao is Quantra. So when you're reading old recipes, um, choose which one of those you want based on what your personal preference is. Do you want it to be sweeter or do you want it to just be more orange intense? But never ever buy anything that's blue. <laughs> that's funny that's one of my things it's like never drink anything that's blue it's never gonna be good. <laughs> no, it's, not, it's not okay it's not um, okay my mother taught me that at three if it's blue don't drink it unless it's like this but this is violet and it's right that's different violet because it has violets in it right <laughs> so it's okay marcia okay. question <laughs> Um, so you had mentioned the classic cocktail formula is two parts liquor, three quarter parts of a sweet component. <laughs> but what was the other one, the middle one? Sour. What's the, what's the proportion of? One part sour. Thank you. And that, if you follow that ratio, that formula right there, that is a classic daiquiri. 
that is a classic margarita, that is a Cosmo. Like these are all cocktails that we know, and that's the recipe. So once you got those proportions right, it doesn't matter whether you're using rum or gin or vodka or tequila, they all work all the time, forever. You will be like the hero of all parties all the time. So if I wanted to make a picture of a cocktail for a party, just follow the same formula. Um, yes and no. So I love that idea and I want you to pre-batch and I think that is, it's the best thing to do. And like, you know, instead of showing up at somebody's house with a bottle of wine, why not show up with a pre-batch cocktail? Like it's so much cooler. So what you do is it kind of depends on doing a pitcher is a little bit of a challenge because are you icing it beforehand? Are you just putting ice in the pitcher? That, that pitchers are much more of a tricky situation than if you just do a bottle. So if you, this is a 25 ounce bottle. So if you take your, what those proportions are, um, whenever you add ice to a cocktail, there are three reasons why you do that. You want to uh, achieve dilution, you want to mix the drink, and you want to chill it. So the amount of time when we, sh when we sugar cocktail, that is adding 0.25 ounces of liquid to the cocktail. So if you're doing a pre-batch and you're just going to put this bottle in your fridge so it's going to be cold and you can just pour it like this because you're at the park or drive-in theater or whatever you're doing, um, you want to add that amount of water. If you're doing it in a pitcher, then I really, really recommend that you use very large ice cubes um, and just put in a couple, otherwise you're gonna get way too diluted way too quickly, unless you're just pouring around the pitcher. Okay. Yeah, thank you, that helps. Actually what I do is um, pour from the pitcher into a shaker with the ice to individual cocktails. But so, um, that will help with um, like margaritas, pitchers of margaritas. Yeah. Thanks. My favorite thing to take during the summer when I'm going to a barbecue, I take Tim's cup, a pitcher of Tim's cup and just mix that. So I've got the pims and the fruit ready to go and I add, add soda water or sparkling lemonade, whatever I'm putting in it. That's a great Cheryl, idea. And that's what I drink, pims. If I've had gin, it's a pims. In I, London, I, I've had yeah. a few. It's a great thing to take to like a 4th of July barbecue yeah. or any barbecue during the summer because it's different. And I have a pins picture and that's, that's what I take. A little different. I love pins. Um, so any questions? <laughs> oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Marsha. that you can do is you can take your little cute little mason jars and freeze that freeze the amount that you want to be your ice in here. And then you just have your, take this frozen as ice and then you take your spirits on the side, and then when you're at your event, pour it onto it, and you have your ice cube already in your glass. Wow, isn't that smart? Very cool. Yeah. So any other questions before we move on to cocktail number three? No? Okay. I have one more question. Okay, go ahead. I have a Meyer lemon tree in my yard, so I usually just use Meyer lemons instead of regular lemons. They're definitely sweeter. So what I generally do is just cut back a little bit on if there's something sweet in the, the drink um, to balance it out. But I'm still not 100% sure whether I'm missing anything with the sourness because the Meyer lemon doesn't have really any sour. Well, I think the way that you're compensating for it is that you're adding more alcohol. <laughs> that's pulling back your level of um, what you would be in uh, identifying as sweet with strong. So you are compensating for it. You're just doing it in your own unique way because you have this wonderful like money tree in your backyard. Um, the other thing that I would do though is before you juice your lemons, do you have a Y peeler? Do you know what a Y peeler looks like as opposed to a zester? Yeah, okay. So I would wide peel. Now I would not recommend to other people 
who don't have Meyer lemons, I would not recommend that they use a Y peeler because you're gonna get way too much pith. What you wanna use is a zester. Do you guys know what a zester looks like? Did I go grab mine? Is that like that? I'm sorry? Is that like this one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Like that. Yeah, so if you're using traditional citrus, traditional lemons or limes, you need to use that type of a zester. If you're using um, Meyer lemons, you need to use a Y peeler because you actually wanna get down into that pith and pull some of that bitterness out. So I would do that. And then there's two things that you can do. Always, always, always do that before you juice your lemon because otherwise you're just taking this natural product and throwing it away. So peel it before you juice it um, and then either dehydrate it and chop it up and make it into, you know, like a sugar or a salt or just put it straight into your cocktail because that's going to bring in the, that more tart, sour, bitter quality that you're missing because you're using a Meyer lemon. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Also, you can take that stuff, this stuff that you've like, once you've zested it and you've dehydrated it, and you can either dehydrate it in a proper dehydrator. If you don't have a proper dehydrator, that's fine too. Put it in a low oven, or if you're in a dry climate, you can just let it sit on a paper towel and it will naturally dehydrate. And put it on chicken, put it in your salad, like use it for everything. It's not just for cocktails, but don't throw away those peels, like use them. Great advice, thank you. Cool. So let's move on to cocktail number three before we finish. So this is a bramble and we're gonna make this in a rocks glass. And this is the traditional, this is actually considered a double rocks glass, um, this size. So this cocktail was actually created in the 80s by a bartender in Soho who wanted to create what he considered was the quintessentially perfect British cocktail. So um, I think that he did a really good job. We're going to do a slightly modified version because most of us won't have the, the what makes it unique is the fact that it has creme de mure. Creme de mure is a French liqueur that is flavored with blackberries. Um, most of us don't have that on our bar cart. That's okay. Uh, we're gonna do a little work around with either those fresh blackberries or blackberry jam, or if you don't have blackberry jam, you could even do it with like strawberry jam. You, whatever you've got, it's fine. You just wanna bring in some sort of dark fruity component. So it's, um, we're going back to our classic proportions of a two ounces of our gin and putting that all into the mixing tin so our, our glass is just sitting to the side for the moment so we're going to make everything in our mixing tin or whatever shaking device you've got um, so two ounces and then again it's three-fourths of an ounce of we're using lemon Um, because we're using the blackberries and they're a little bit sweet, you want to pull back on the sugar a little bit. So I'm just going to put in a quarter, a quarter to a third of an ounce of simple syrup based on what you think your personal preferences are and also how sweet your fruit is because some, you know, sometimes our blackberries aren't sweet at all right now. So all that goes in. Do we add ice? Yeah, you want to add ice to your shaker. So the ice is always the very last thing that goes into the shaker. Hey, so we did, I don't think we talked about using ice from your refrigerator this time, right? No, we have yet, no. Um, so it's, the ice that you use makes an enormous difference on the quality of the cocktail that you have as a result. So the ice, if your refrigerator makes its own ice, you never ever want to use that. And the reason being, um, as it's processing, 
it's freezing so quickly that it's getting a lot of air bubbles trapped into it so that when you go to shake with it or even if you're just serving it it melts so much faster and that is going to create a lot of dilution so again going back to our proportions when you have proper, proper ice you're only getting a 0.25 percent dilution if you have ice that's made in your own freezer that's like machines, it's going to melt way faster. So it's going to be way too watered down. The other thing is that when ice freezes, it does not matter how clean your refrigerator is, it is going to pick up smells from your refrigerator. So if you have salmon or cheese in your refrigerator, your ice is going to taste like salmon and cheese. And that's fine, but it's going to taste terrible in your cocktail. So don't use the ice that your refrigerator makes in a cocktail. I would just turn it off and just not use that thing at all. And what you really should do, or what I suggest that you do, do whatever you want to do, but I suggest that you buy one of those big cubers, like um, you can get them on Amazon, either spherical or square, whatever works for you. I actually have one that's um, in a diamond shape and it has a lid on it and you pour water into these little holes on the top so that you're creating this really big piece of ice. And then as soon as it's frozen, take it out of that, put it into a Ziploc bag, store it in there, and then it's not gonna absorb the smells from your refrigerator. Who knew? <laughs> Had no idea. Yeah, it, I have, I have, yeah. I go to people's houses and I'm like, Use the chicken. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> okay. So, yeah. So then, what we're gonna do? So we put our, we made our cocktail in here. So now we have our glass. And in an ideal world, what you would do is you would pour your cocktail over your ice in the glass, and then you would drizzle it with creme de mur, and that's the blackberry flavored French liqueur. Um, I don't have that. So what I'm doing is taking fresh blackberries and I'm gonna use five because this is about the size of my blackberries. So I've got like a nice little layer of blackberries in the bottom of my glass and I am going to muddle them with a proper muddler. If you don't have a proper muddler, that's totally fine. You can use a wooden spoon. You can use um, a metal spoon. The end of your zester. <laughs> you can use anything that's going to this type of product. And the way that you muddle, no matter what tool you're using, you basically want to go in this type of a fashion. And you notice I'm not doing this kind of thing because if I did that, I would end up with blackberry all over me. And I basically you want to muddle to the point where everything is broken down. Oh, I'm not going to be able to show you that. Well, you know what stuff muddle looks like, right? If you were having jam, um, instead of fresh blackberries, what I would do is put like a spoon. But the jam is much more concentrated. So I put sort of a bar spoon in the bottom of my glass with um, a little bit of room temperature alcohol. So we're using the gin. So I would put just a little bit of gin in there and then just sort of swirl it around and that's gonna break it up. Because if you take anything like honey or jam and you add ice to it, it's just gonna congeal. You're never gonna be able to break it up. You always want to add something that's room temperature, break it up that way, and then add your cocktail to it. So this is not a perfect bramble but it's going to taste amazing. Yes. Oh, that's very pretty. I used creme de cassis in mine. You used what? Creme de cassis. Oh, nice. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's really good. Because it's got that tartness. <laughs> Too much simple syrup. It's still got a tartness to it. 
but it's got a really good flavor. Fresh, pretty. Fresh. You can basically, um, if you aren't, you can also do it with frozen berries. If you're gonna do frozen berries, that's perfectly fine. Just let them defrost before you do it. So you can have this bright summery cocktail year round. And it's, a, and it's a British classic, so. Wonderful. So any, que any questions from Marsha? No. I, I don't know about you, but I've learned a lot tonight. We think we know about cocktails, but I've learned a, a lot. So I think it's great. Okay. Marsha, perhaps a nice hostess gift would be bringing a bag of ice, huh? That's good. Yeah, it was a really good bag of ice. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, the, that's my next question. So, bagged ice from, say, the liquor store is suitable? Yes. Um, so, it depends on what your liquor store um, or ice. So, or supermarket <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. So, I'm, that's definitely a better alternative to anything that's being made in your home freezer. Um, the really good ones, like, I, I don't know, I'm kind of spoiled, like, my local liquor store has uh, cold draft square cubes that are hand carved, like, in a bag. So, it, that's, that, I mean, that's Hollywood, though, right? Yes. Oh, Hollywood. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, where is that? I don't that's think I'm going to get Angeles? that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I don't right. think my liquor store will have that either. Uh, yeah. You know, I don't think many do. <laughs> okay, so you before can't we Amazon that. Right. Before we finish, we've got a couple of giveaways to do. So Marsha, pick two numbers for me um, between two and nine. Seven, okay. Four. So seven is Alton. If you it should still be on. Two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, seven's Alton. And one, two, three, four. So Sharon, you've won two nights and it's either gonna be Ligon Arms or Chuton Glen. Which Both sounds wonderful. Right. Thank you. And yes. Elton, I don't see you there, but you've won a bottle bottle of Grey Whale gin. And I actually have a Grey Whale recycled candle as well. So mm -hmm. I'm gonna be sending you those. <laughs> so Yay, I thank you. You're welcome. Very so, nice. I just want to say, well, Jerry, you did well as well, right? <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you so you much. You started. So, yeah. Um, so, I just want to say thank you for joining us this evening. I hope you enjoyed our little gin and iconic session. Um, and thank you to Marsha for the great information and giving us uh, three new cocktails to put in our repertoire. There's actually Marsha's actually part of the shelter in place drinking group as well. So if you're not a member of that on Facebook, there's, and Dana Lynn is as well, there's some great cocktail recipes that what, I've been following. What is it? Shelter? shelter in place drinking. Okay. It's on Facebook. It's on Facebook. And if you can't find it, let me know and I can invite you. But you just post what we start. It was started by Melissa Beale started it mm -hmm. up in the Bay. So there's actually a lot of meetings industry people on there, and you just post whatever beer, drink, cocktail, wine, whatever you want to on there. And it's Melissa. Kind of She's great. She's great. So yeah, Melissa started it. So if you're not a member, it's kind of a fun, a fun group to belong to. And it's funny because some people have been like, "I found my tribe." <laughs> Well, Marsha, I've had the first two, but I've never had a bramble. So I'm looking forward to having that soon. Thank you. It, it's good. Enjoy it. So thank you, Marsha, again, for doing a great class. She always does a, an amazing job. We've worked together a couple of times now. And she does all sorts of usually in-person events. So she'll actually do this at an event and, and mix cocktails and whatever. So, But now it's all in the virtual world. So Thank you. Thanks, Marsha. Thank oh, you. It was so great to see everybody and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank, Thank you for you. the invite, Cheryl. Thank you. Okay, Thank you're you. Thanks. Take care. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. -bye.